Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Illinois Power Agency, welcome to today's uh, stakeholder workshop. This workshop is related to the procurement of RECs from utility scale wind and solar projects, as well as brownfield site photovoltaic projects. My name is Benjamin Chi. I am with NERA. NERA is the procurement administrator for the Illinois Power Agency. With us today is Mr. Brian Granahan, Ms. Anthony Starr, and Ms. Sarah Duffy from the agency, as well as Ms. Katie Olandi from NERA. Over on to slide two. Uh, before I begin, we'll have a few high level remarks and housekeeping items. So first, this workshop is being recorded and the presentation as well as the audio will be posted to the agency's website after the conclusion of uh, the workshop. If you have registered for this uh, workshop, we will send you uh, an announcement via email after the presentation and audio has been posted. Second, for planning purposes, uh, we have set aside two hours for today's workshop. You'll see here on the um, slide, the agenda, we have about 20 slides prepared, mainly to tee up the issues and to facilitate the dialogue. The discussion today is not limited to just the items that we're teeing up. Uh, so you should not feel limited to bring up any issues that you see are important to our discussion today. For our agenda, we will provide a regulatory background and context for the renewable procurements uh, that we are conducting. And then we will talk about some of the comments we have received, which will become the discussion points for the workshop today. Most importantly, I want to at least uh, note this for participants up front. Today's workshop is to reflect on some of the lessons we've learned based on the procurement's help. And our posture is really to engage and to listen to you, the stakeholders, on the issues that matter to you. So unless you identify the issues for us, we do not know what we are solving for. So here we are taking a very holistic look uh, at the workshop uh, in this workshop to understand uh, first, if there are any barriers to our requirements and if there are any competing opportunities vying for your interest. Uh, and the end goal is how can we improve to make the procurements more attractive to developers like yourself to come build renewables in Illinois. So the main takeaway uh, is that this workshop is for you. We are here mainly to listen uh, to your issues, your pain points, um, things that are good, as well as things that we could improve on. So if you have issues you think will need to be uh, addressed, I encourage you to not hold back. We wanna listen uh, to you and we wanna hear about them. I will provide some instructions on the format of the workshop and how to comment on items on today's uh, workshop. But before I do that, I wanna invite Ms. Anthony Starr from the agency to provide us with some uh, of the regulatory background and context. Mr. Starr. Great, thank you, Mr. T. Next slide, please. So for a little background, I suspect most of the people on the call today will be fairly familiar with this, but just to sort of, sort of level set where we are, the index direct procurement that the Illinois Power Agency uses to procure RECs from utility scale wind, utility scale solar or brownfield site um, projects comes out of the provisions in the Illinois Power Agency Act that were, were revised um, in the fall of 2021 through the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, we had previous procurements using a fixed rec price model that was changed through CJA. And now we've run two procurements under this new model um, where the price for the renewable energy credit varies based upon the difference between a price bid by bidders in the procurement and the price of electricity for the applicable month. We've now held two procurement events, and we'll go into a little bit more information on them in the next slides um, that were conducted last year. And as we saw from the results, I think some were um, a little different from what people had expected. And we, you know, this was a new pro um, process that was taking place in the backdrop of a very volatile energy market in 2022. But we want to reflect on what we saw last year, what we can learn from that, and what changes we can make going forward. So this is a quick overview of the two procurement events that took place last year. Um, the set of goals are listed up at the top. You can see the average winning bid. This is a strike price, not a renewable energy credit price. That's something if you're familiar with earlier procurements the IPA has conducted 
or the work we do for distributed generation or community solar. These numbers are not comparable to that because this is the strike price. The price of the renewable energy credit would be the difference, as I said, between this and the actual energy price. And we'll be talking a little bit later, I have some questions about how that is set. In the first procurement we held in the spring of last year, we had four utilities, excuse me, four utility scale solar projects selected, one brownfield site project, and one, and one utility scale wind project. In the fall procurement, we had more utility scale projects, solar projects selected seven, more an increase in our in brownfield projects, but no wind projects were selected. I think something else I want to note compared to some earlier procurements that the IPA has conducted is that we've seen on the solar side, a larger variation in the size of projects participating, which might be an indicator of how the solar market it, that is um, developing here. But that again, obviously this two procurements, this is a li limited set, set of observations, but this is sort of the backdrop we have of what we saw that took place last year in terms of the scale of participation being lower than the targets that we had and the pr strike prices perhaps I think certain uh, people think that these may have been higher than maybe had been expected. Next slide. So what's next? There's really three different lanes in which the um, improvements or changes to the process can be considered. The first is through the ongoing process of the procurements that we have planned for this year. So we have a procurement scheduled for early summer of 2023. Um, this is based upon the provisions in our current long-term plan, the document that guides the work of the agency on renewables. There are certain changes we might be able to consider from the feedback that we've received and are talked about today that we could include into that procur procurement. If that procurement does not meet its volumes, we would then hold another procurement later in this calendar year. So that's sort of lane one. Lane two would be that this summer, we will be updating our long-term plan. We're re releasing a draft of it for stakeholder feedback that starts a whole regulatory process that will conclude in February of 2024. That will guide the procurements in 2024 and 2025 in, uh, for index rec. So the extent to which there are things in the current long-term plan that could be changed, there's a window of opportunity to consider that over the summer, the fall, and into early next year. The third lane is that there may be things that there's aspects of the way the law is currently written that may need reconsideration or changes. And the opportunities there would be um, through legislation before the Illinois General Assembly. There's already a number of bills being introduced that make various changes to renewable standards in Illinois. We're likely to see more proposals as the spring comes along as well. So there are things that fall outside of what we can do through our procurement structures or our long-term plan. Those ultimately would need to be addressed legislatively. And today, what we're really hoping to hear is discussion you know, uh, that can span across all three of these categories. Um, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. So this, I think, also just sort of co cover what I just mentioned. What we're really interested in is, you know, Hearing more from what, what, what have been the barriers that have limited participation so far? Are there things that we can do to improve it, change it, things? Then another thing we want to acknowledge, and you'll see through some of the slides coming up, is that we did previously, prior to this workshop, hold a written comment period, and we really appreciate the comments that were provided. Those are available on the IPA's website, and a lot of the slides you'll be seeing moving forward from here are based upon that feedback. But certainly if there's things people participating today brought up in their written comments that they wanna reiterate on or expound on today, that's something we were very interested in hearing. Likewise, if you've reviewed the comments of other parties and would like, like to add your thoughts to those, again, something that we would love to hear today. And then if you did not take part in that um, written comment process, this is a, a opportunity for you to add your um, thoughts and feedback to, uh, to us as well so that we can consider all these um, opportunities for how do we improve the index direct procurement model and expand the renewables supporting Illinois customers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Starr for those uh, uh, comments and your uh, opening remarks there. Um, over onto the next slide. On this uh, slide onwards, here we will now proceed 
to the more engaging portion of today's workshop. We will tee up the issue. Uh, and then if you have comments you'd like to raise, uh, locate the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. There should be a raise hand function and then wait. One of our staff will then let you know you can unmute yourself uh, to speak. Uh, you do not need to identify yourself or your company or your affiliations. Uh, you simply need to unmute yourself and let your comments be heard. Um, we will, however, prompt you using your first name and last initial uh, so that you know and be, it can be queued up uh, to unmute yourself. Uh, on the next slide, here we have a summary of some of the items that we will cover, um, but just want to quickly uh, note for you that we will tee up the issue, we will pause at that uh, time at each slide and throughout the presentation really on these uh, items to take your comments. Um, importantly, uh, there is a free for all slide uh, or item on uh, the 10th item that you will see here. So if there's anything that is not covered, just take a mental note on these key items that we will be covering, discussing. If you see anything ahead of time, you know uh, it's not being covered uh, for items one through nine, then uh, please be prepared to uh, discuss that with us in item, when we get to item number 10. And uh, over on to the next slide. So to be very clear, our discussion today uh, is not limited to what changes we can make to the upcoming summer 2023 procurement. We are here uh, on a very holistic basis to understand if the entire procure procurement structure and approach is sound uh, and if it is attractive to developers so that you will want to come and build renewables here in Illinois and the region. So as such, do not let the elements in the law or the long-term plan limit our discussion today. If there are issues, we simply want to hear about them. Uh, as Anthony has said, we recognize that for some of the issues, we may need legislative changes and we may need to tee up these issues in the uh, next update to the agency's long-term procurement plan. Um, so here, we want to know how the agency can be helpful in those discussions and what information you would like to see from the agency. And with that, I will uh, turn the time over back to uh, Mr. Anthony Starr to tee up our first item on the RPS uh, budget. Mr. Starr. Great, thank you. So the first item we'll talk about is the RPS budget, which is something that has been the subject of multiple comments, both in this most recent process, as well as in earlier feedback processes that the IPA um, has, has ran last year. As an update of where the IPA is, we're currently refreshing the RPS budget from what was included in a long-term plan, and we expect we'll be releasing that in early March. One of the things that we're looking at as we're doing that is, what is the impact of the ranges of future energy prices on the cost of index RECs? As I mentioned, the index REC price is based upon the difference between the strike price and the actual price of energy. So as we're looking at the RPS budget and trying to forecast into the future, look, understanding the different forecasts of future energy prices can have significant impact on the RPS budget. Um, key observations here. One is that we, you know, the, we had significant energy price volatility in 2022. And so depending on when you're doing this forecast and how you're looking at it, you can see very different vi um, visions of the future. So trying to understand and provide a few different scenarios on what that might look like will be part of this process. In a nutshell, if future energy prices are high, the result is that index direct prices would be low and even potentially negative. So that would um, reduce the impact on the RPS budget in future years if we see energy prices significantly higher than, than what are forecast. The flip side, which is perhaps of more concern, is that if energy prices are, remain low in the future, then the index rec prices will result higher and that will have a larger impact on the budget. And so that is a key portion, I think, of what, when we talk about the RPS budget and want to hear people's concerns, understanding um, the trade-offs between the two of those. Um, another observation is that the strike price we saw did go up a bit between average strike price between the spring and fall procurements last year. There was a question that was submitted asking whether the prices we published 
whether those are weighted averages or straight line averages, those were weighted averages. So they take into account the different sizes of the projects. It's not just a simple average of all the different projects. Another thing that will be an impact on the RPS budget as we go forward is that we're also in the process of stepping back and taking a fresh look at the REC prices for the adjustable block program. Unlike indexed direct procurements, these prices are administratively set through a process determined by the IPA through our long-term plan. So in, as we reconsider that model and do new modeling for the adjustable block program, that could have an impact on, those REC prices could potentially change significantly and that would also have an impact on the budget going forward. So again, there's a, there's a lot of variables going into our consideration of the budget and the various impacts. Next slide, please. So overview of some of the comments that we received. Um, one is that there was a concern that the R REC prices in the um, spring and fall procurements were high and that that will have a larger impact on the RPS budget than uh, stakeholders had presumed. A second was because of concerns about the RPS budget, there was an interest in having sellers have an options around what would happen if there was, is a shortfall in the RPS budget in terms of being able to continue to deliver RECs or have those deferred to future years. So we're interested in hearing a little bit more about that. We also had feedback around the idea of there being a buyer side collateral. Right now, sellers have to provide collateral to as part of their performance insurance. But if there's concerns about budget availability, some feedback we heard was a, a desire for there sort of be collateral going the other direction as well to help um, ensure availability of funds to pay um, for indexed RECs. We also had a number of requests around the impact on the RPS budget of the 2022 procurements and there was at their strike prices as well as what the impacts would be in terms of ability to meet future procurement goals. And as I mentioned, that is part of the analysis that we'll be providing in March. So now this is where we'd like to open up for some feedback. These are a couple of items that we had flagged, but obviously we welcome people to address these questions or other questions or concerns you might have. First is what, you know, what, what can we do absent legislation that changes the RPS um, budget in terms of how it's collected and how the money is spent. We are also more interested more in learning, learning more about the buyer's performance insurance model that's been proposed, how that would be funded, where it would come from, is this possible without a statutory exchange? And is this, as we think sort of holistically about um, the noble portfolio standard in Illinois is, would setting aside some of the RPS budget for some sort of performance assurance be the um, best allocation of the RPS budget? So with that, I will pause. First, I don't know, Brian, do you have anything you would like to add on the budget or should we open it up to feedback? <clears throat> No, I think all of that is a, is a thank you, Anthony. I think that all that was um, really good coverage for it, in particular that last point, because then we've heard this buyer's performance assurance point a number of times, and then we kind of reflect on um, well, what's legally possible here? And um, the source of that funding would seem like it would have to come from collections that would otherwise be used to support other programs, other procurements, other initiatives. So you're basically holding some money in escrow and saying that if for whatever reason RPS funds run out, then these contracts are being funded. Well, that doesn't seem like it's the most productive use of those funds. So what solutions, If do we have other solutions that parties recognize available to us? Um, and if not, then this is something where there would be a statutory change required. So that's, that's the sort of thing I think we want to explore here and why this is part of a discussion around the RPS budget as opposed to a discussion around, say, collateral requirements or other things that are more contract oriented. So we view this idea of buyer's performance assurance as, fit, as fitting into the budget discussion because it seems like it's intended to address a concern related to the budget. So with that, I guess I would just uh, hand it back over to Anthony and, and open it up for anyone else who, have, who might have comments. Yeah, and just a reminder again uh, to raise uh, comments in, on this uh, session, simply find and locate the raise hand function uh, and we, one of our staff will uh, prompt you to unmute yourself uh, to get your uh, comments heard. So uh, please raise your hands now if you have comments on this particular issue, uh, we'd like to hear about them.
Okay, thank you, Sophia D. I'll prompt you to unmute. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yep. Hi, uh, and just wanted to uh, make sure, uh, are you requiring um, uh, disclosure, I guess? No, no, no. Like you don't need to disclose yourself. You do not need to disclose your company or your affiliations. Yeah, Understood. You Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like, um, uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure I fully understood the expectations. So thank you. Um, so um, from the uh, renewable developer perspective, um, a key consideration that we have in terms of um, the budget, and this leads into the question of buyer performance assurance, is um, uh, what is the certainty that like uh, what certainty do we have that entering into this contract um, we will get paid throughout the term of the contract um, and uh, I, I know that at least for us um, and our decision makers um, that's a major consideration about dis uh, when it comes to deciding um, what our levels of participation will look like um, and for our leadership um, acknowledging that the language having that caused previous shortfalls was fixed through legislation. Um, there is still the concern that um, the, like you said, it's very difficult to uh, foresee the future. Uh, the future is very, uh, the prices can vary widely, but it seems like there is uh, a lot of restriction around um, or it seems like the the IPA is um, somewhat uh, constrained in how uh, flexible or um, uh, how the budget is allocated, or I guess not as responsive as maybe the market will be. So um, my question to you is, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, if you would mind discussing uh, how you see that you are limited through legislation and when it comes to uh, allocation uh, of the budget, um, in what situations would the IPA be um, permitted to go over budget if it means fulfilling contracts, um, or is, is that possible at all, and um, what uh, what can, um, I, I guess from a renewable developer perspective that it's looking at um, uh, payment certainty as a major component of this participation, um, what provisions uh, do you see currently exist or are possible to increase that certainty, um, if not through a buyer's performance assurance. And I know that was a lot. <laughs> Let me know if there's any part of that you'd like me to repeat. It's I can lot. be so go, go ahead, Ryan. No, it's a lot, but it's all kind of the same core question. Um, at least to me it is. I don't know, Sophia, but that's um, <clears throat> your sense as well. But it basically comes down to like look at, at some point there is a cap associated with the amount of funds that are being collected annually and can be spent to support renewables. Under a floating rec procurement structure, it is possible to have a number of years where the prices are very high um, because wholesale energy prices would be very low and that would result in budget impacts that um, ultimately could in theory um, cause that cap to be exceeded and what alternatives are there available and how do we manage that uncertainty? But to me, that's kind of the core issue, Sophia. If that's, um, I don't know if you'd be unmuted, but I don't know if that is a Yes. Yes, thank you. That is that's what I'm getting at. So I guess I would say like three or four things on this, and then and then Anthony may have more to add beyond that. The first is I think if you look at prior situations where this has occurred, whether it was through the curtailments across um, the early to mid 2010s or the RPS budget situation um, in 2021, 
Um, the IPA took action in each situation to try to rectify the situation and make developers whole. And then ultimately there was some effort legislatively made to ensure that was the case. And there was a structural change to make sure that everyone was made whole and payments were not missed out on. And there's a history of that. And there's a legacy of that. And there's a sense that that's what always needs to happen in these sorts of situations. Uh, the second is that there were changes that were enacted through CJA that allows us to roll over unspent budget from prior years. So what you're really talking about is a situation that did not exist across 20, you know, into, going into 2021. So if you have variance year over year where prices go up and prices go down, as opposed to being consistently low, then in years where wholesale energy prices are high, you will have lower rec procurement costs for index rec contracts and the money that is saved can then be rolled over into future years. So you're really talking about a situation where it's market conditions are over a prolonged period of time. Um, the third is um, the priority given to contracts um, that are already executed in 175 of the IPA Act. I forgot, I, I don't remember the exact subparagraph offhand, but it gives you some sense of at least priority for existing contracts that are enacted and have payment obligations associated with them. And hopefully that at least provides some sense of priority for those contracts. Um, I think it's, you know, ideally there's a better solution available than all of those things put together. I think where we're running, running into an issue is just like, managing these issues on the margins. So you have year over year of high wholesale, I'm sorry, of low wholesale energy prices and high index rec prices. What do we do to prepare for that sort of a circumstance? And how do we do it in a way that doesn't take away from other important initiatives? And I'm not sure that we have that tool available to us right now um, statutorily. I'm not sure we can just sort of pull money aside without taking it out of the broader RPS circulation and just sort of keep it parked to try to make developers whole in that case. But you know, I think the notion that there's, there's gotta be some sort of solution that we get where you're coming from. Um, so the points that I offered previously are hopefully helpful. And the last thing I'll say is we are in the midst of developing an RPS budget update that hopefully has tools that parties can use to assess that risk for themselves. Anthony can speak more authoritatively on this, but if you can then say, make changes to inputs and do scenario planning yourself, it empowers you to be in a better position to judge that risk for yourself. And I think that's something um, that we're hoping is helpful to the market and helpful to financing parties. With that, Anthony, I don't know if you have anything further to add. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think the challenge is the, you yeah, know, what we want to, what we will be doing through the budget update is, is providing a tool where you can put in different scenarios of, of future energy, for prices to sort of see what the potential impacts are. One of the tools that we would have available, and I think th this is where one of our timing challenges comes, is that through our long-term plan, we propose program sizes for the adjustable block program. We propose procurement volumes for the indexed rec procurements. We have goals in the law for how many recs we're supposed to have under contract by certain dates, but we have the ability to slow down or speed that up a bit through our long-term plan, but that then, is slightly disconnected from what will happen with energy prices and thus the resulting budget impact from the index directs in that, you know, while over time, we, I, I think it's safe to assume there will be a long-term price curve. The, the volatility we saw last year certainly showed that in the short term, you could see prices going very high or very low um, in ways that we didn't expect. So while there are certainly scenarios where low energy prices were result in very high rec prices. We may also, see, you know, before getting to a year like that, there may also be a year if we see price spikes like last year where rec price index rec prices would be negative and that would actually be a net infusion into the RPS budget. And so, um, but ultimately I think something through legislative changes will probably um, need to be on the table here. There was a question um, submitted in the chat about the, um, IPA's legacy of attempting to address these changes. Let me just add a little bit to what Brian said there. There have been two situations where this has come up previously. One was in 2013 and 2014 under the initial sort of version of the state's RPS, where because of customer switching the funds available year to year to support um, contra um, RPA rec contracts would vary because um, it would, it would, they were dependent on how many customers were taking default supply service from the utilities versus um, from the alternative supplier. And there was a shortfall for ComEd in the funds available for the contracts that were entered into in 2010 um, 
through the long-term power purchase agreements that were conducted that year. The IPA proposed a plan to use the Renewable Energy Resources Fund, which at the time had a very different structure than it does today, to help um, offset some of the um, curtailed contract volumes that we were able to make um, the contract holders whole through that and a few other things. Then also leading up to the passage of CJ in the summer of 2021, where we were seeing potential budget shortfalls because of the prior structure of the RPS, where um, after the first four years, funds had, coming in each year had to be used that year or were returned to customers. We initiated a process that summer to sort of create a, a process by which um, we could adjust the amount, uh, um, amounts for contracts and try to address some of the concerns that people had contracts would have in that process. Now, fortunately, that, that ended up being rendered moot by the passage of CJ. But again, it's an example of where we saw something was coming because of the some structural aspects of how RPS collections worked. And we tried to come up within the confines of what we could do through our planning processes, ways in which to address that and make um, contract holders whole. Obviously, in that case, a legislative fix in terms of what we saw in CJ was necessary, and that may still be the situation. But again, um, I think one of the things we want to underscore is that we, 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 we want to make this successful. We have certain constraints in the law of what we can do, but ultimately our goal is to try to work collaboratively with the industry to create the right set of risks and rewards. Are there other questions or comments regarding the budget? I don't see any other hands raised at the moment, but maybe we can give people a minute. Actually, this is um, obviously a, a central topic. Yep, uh, looks like Sophia again. Let's see, I'll allow to talk. We should be prompted to unmute. Thank you so much. Um, this is Sophia again. Uh, I really appreciate uh, that context, that background um, certainly helps us understand um, situation and uh, the um, perspective of um, the agency and of course want to express gratitude for um, the uh, your efforts in um, past situations where there have been potential or actual shortfalls to make sure that um, payments are made whole. So I, I wanted I have a really quick follow-up question on this um, on the something that was uh, brought up a little bit earlier on the fact that um, there is a, uh, a within the legislation there is a sense of priority for projects that have existing payments um, I'm wondering if uh, you see that as something that could be potentially memorialized um, within say the contract um, to formalize that sense of um, uh, priority for, for us, that would be a, um, an essential piece of certainty. I don't think the contract is the right place for it. Um, because ultimately this would be as between or as across multiple different instruments. So one instrument would not be the place for it. Um, the priority in the law of what projects or what contracts take priority was something that was what we used, I think in, in, for guidance in our filing back in 2021, in March of 2021, in addressing expected RPS budget shortfalls when funds couldn't be rolled over. So how we dealt with that and how we interpreted and applied that language was something that was part of like a regulatory filing. And that may be the better way to do it, to handle issues that are effectively statutory interpretation issues through a regulatory filing. And I think we can kind of consider that as part of the next long-term plan, or at least open it up for comments as part of the next long-term plan process and see what sort of feedback we get and um, whether it's something that's a viable alternative. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, let's see, it looks like we have a question from Chris. You should be prompted to unmute. Yeah, so I have a comment and a question. Um, on the comment side, it's just to say that for those of us that are, I think, enmeshed in Illinois 
policy regulatory worlds on this stuff. I, I, I totally agree with how you've characterized the IPA's response to previous um, budget shortfalls. Um, but if you put yourself in the shoes of a financing counterparty in New York that knows very little about the Illinois landscape, what they see is two budget shortfalls over the life of one of these contracts, right? A 15 or 20 year contract. It's happened twice in that period. And they see a contract that says there's effectively no resource or no recourse for the seller in that situation. Uh, so they're essentially trusting. It, it's hard for them to understand that nuance and, and, and just sort of trust, uh, I guess, that, you know, this will be resolved. Um, so, you know, I, I, that makes it challenging when the IPA contracts are not the only game in town, right? And so to get back to the sort of broadest question here of like, why haven't these procurements been quite so successful? It's because there is a lot of competition in the marketplace for these projects. And through one route, we have kind of what I just described. And through the other, we have a, a voluntary offtake market of counterparties that are very willing to be flexible on the terms of their contracts and kind of work through this hand in hand. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's part of the challenge that we see um, with, with these. And I, I fully appreciate the constraints um, that you know, you're seeing in, in terms of what the law says and what the rate payer cap is and, and all of that. But that is the, um, that's the explanation as I've, as I've understood it from uh, our financing folks and, and, and project origination folks. Um, so that, that's the comment. The question is, is it the IPA's, um, the IPA's interpretation of that funding priority statute that any, that once a contract is signed, so hypothetically the, the contracts from these last two utility scale procurements, that they are now underneath that bucket of quote unquote existing contracts. Because I think that that could be read two different ways, contracts right. that, because there's a date in there. So having that, um, you know, I, we, you know we, we've kind of wrestled internally of, well, how is that going to be interpreted? So if the IPA could provide some definitive guidance, uh, maybe it's not in a contract, maybe it isn't through, through the, maybe it's through the, the next long-term plan, whatever it is, Having something definitive from the IPA saying like, hey, look, we know there might be some budget uncertainty in the future, given energy price volatility, all of that stuff. But like once you get a contract, you're going to be prioritized regardless of when it was necessarily established. Like once you're in, you're in and you're going to be mm -hmm. safe. I think that would go a very long way. Yeah. And and and. Um, as I'm sure you can appreciate, we have to think pretty hard about the pluses and minuses of that approach. Um, the, the That is something that could be handled through a long-term plan, most likely. We couldn't speak on it and give an authoritative interpretation just because whatever it is that we said is how we saw the law could then be litigated before the ICC and ultimately what the ICC um, determined would govern. So it's not something where we can provide that sort of authoritative um, approach back or, or sort of, I'm sorry, authoritative interpretation back but it is the place in the law where um, when we were handling this issue back in 2021, um, that was the language that everyone was focused on and trying to work their way through and get some sort of understanding of what, how it should be interpreted. So it's something we can flag for the next long-term plan development process. And I wish that there was a short-term answer to this, but I think that's the only way to really handle it, or the only sound way to handle it. Um, you know, Chris, I think, I think what you just described, and we appreciate um, the words around our efforts because we feel like we're trying to do that. And we try to put time and resources in, into making sure that we're doing what we can to solve problems. But that's different than if there are structural issues that lead to these problems in the first place, making sure that those are being taken care of. Um, I think there's two problems there, um, or at least two problems. There are probably more. One is this issue of certainty around payments back to um, the seller at the bid price and whether there is funding available to make sure that those payments can be made. And the second is the inability to otherwise negotiate after participation in a procurement process 
around various contract terms or around the contract price in the case of um, different issues that come up uh, through the development process. So I think that those may be two different things that need to be solved for. And um, the second of those is even more complicated, I'd argue, than the first, just given the fact that given the nature of our competitive procurement events, you don't want to set up an incentive structure where everybody's just bidding in their best case scenario and is looking for downstream negotiations. And you need really tight parameters around these sort of adjustments. But we recognize that that's a problem too. So I, I tend to think of those as two problems. I'm kind of curious, Chris, from your standpoint, whether that's right. Um, but it seems like in both of those, the market may offer alternatives that are a little bit more flexible than what we have here. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that characterization and, and the, perhaps it is maybe more structural than I've given it credit for. Um, I don't know immediately how you would protect against a scenario like that. Um, and, it, and it does just underscore kind of why a lot of companies are attracted to that voluntary market because that flexibility does exist sort of throughout the pro the development process, which is zero aware, you know, right with, with risk, um, you know, because I, I think what, what we've seen is there's more risk to, we view there as uh, these con the IPA contracts is having more risk and therefore the price is necessarily inflated to account for that risk. Um, and so that's you know why you're seeing projects not get selected in here um, because they're coming in above the benchmark price, presumably. Um, although that's a whole separate issue. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with your broadest, you know, the, your characterization more broadly. Chris, I'm curious if you have any observations. I'm not sure what markets you work on um, besides Illinois, but or if others have thoughts on this as well. Are there other states that have handled this successfully or is this fundamentally always going to be a disconnect between statutorily defined procurements and those um done by private ent um private entities um maybe not exact analogy but certainly some of the um, things that flared up in massachusetts around their offshore wind contracts feel to me like um, similar themes are occurring there as well yeah, I mean, Illinois is certainly unique in the MISO region and the deregulated nature of the state, you know, looking to other markets. I, I don't work much um, in, out, outside of this region, but my understanding is um, some of those markets in the states in the east have, in the northeast, have built some flexibility into um, kind of what, what Brian was previously describing, um, you know, after a project is selected, allowing for more you know, kind of uh, some negotiations or price adjustments in the future to account for unforeseen changes rather than having, needing to have a project completely drop out uh, of that process and, and risk their security and, and things like that. Um, you allow at least some opportunity for some negotiation. And I think that's happened. Um, I remember if it's NYSERDA or, or Massachusetts or where, but yeah, I don't, I don't have any particularly keen uh, insights. I just, I don't personally work enough out there. Uh, it looks like we also received a comment from Nicole L. Um, if you'd like, I can unmute if you'd like to speak on that. Can you hear me okay? Yep. 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 Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to note that NYSERDA is currently in discussions with a number of stakeholders that are probably on the phone right now that have contracts with NYSERDA to adjust their current um, contracts to address inflation. I know Anthony brought up uh, the issues with offshore wind on the East Coast. And I think what we're seeing is NYSERDA, which is a very similar agency to the IPA, um, engaging in these discussions and, and acknowledging that if they want to meet their statutory goals that the legislature has put in place for them, that these types of adjustments are necessary. Otherwise, they'll, you know, those projects will drop despite having posted security because they're simply not financially viable at the originally bid prices. Um, so there, it's in their best interest to renegotiate those contracts. Now, I will say that there is no cap on the RPS budget that I am aware of in New York. So that certainly puts New York in a very different position than the Illinois Power Agency. Um, but, you know, something perhaps worth bringing up to those who 
you know, are responsible for making decisions about what the IPA's budget looks like uh, going forward, whether that requires changes from the legislature that, you know, if, if we're really committed to meeting our clean energy goals, we have to be thinking about this going forward. Is there anything, uh, Nicole, you might be able to share about the NYSERDA process? I'm just kind of curious how they're working through this. We do have some relationships there, including the utility scale development side, but um, I'd, I'd be kind of curious how they're bringing folks together and what they're what they're thinking of as the right way to prove up uh, something like a price adjustment. So I don't know how much of that is public, but. Yeah, I, I'm happy to take that to our team, Brian. I think right now it's not particularly public, although some of it was unfortunately captured in Politico Pro. Um, I think that there are certainly companies on the line that would be willing to talk to the IPA about that. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. I uh, want to give one more chance. Anybody else have anything to raise? Otherwise, we, we will, uh, out of the interest of time, we move to the next uh, item. Okay, not seeing any new uh, hands raised. Um, why don't we move that yeah, to the next item? Thank you. So these are a few different issues that we wanted to bring up. Um, the first one is um, right now under the legislation, there are two hubs that can be used for the index um, price, either the PJM NIHUB or MISO Illinois hub, and bidders can choose between them. So this is something that is, is sort of said in the statute, but um, we're interested over in terms of the bigger picture thinking about whether or not having just those two choices is too limiting and whether there's better ways of thinking in an index direct paradigm what you're indexing against. So that's one question we're, we're interested in feedback on. A second that we did not include in our um, request for written comments, um, but I felt we should just bring up is that the law does allow for us to consider a price caller around, um, for the index rec process. This was something that when we developed our long-term plan, stakeholder feedback was very much against and we did not propose a price caller. But given the experiences of 2022 and price volatility, I just wanna open up if there's anyone who has new thoughts about whether price colors are something that should be considered. So as we begin to think about our next long-term plan, I kind of had thought this was probably an issue off the table, but any insights into whether it should come back onto the table for consideration um, would be interested. And then the third issue is right now our choice, our legislation is an index direct price model. We have some potential flexibility for brownfield site projects, but again, thinking bigger picture, um, my impression is some developers like the index rec model, others want something different, whether or not it would make sense to consider something to potential future legislation, which would allow some sort of optionality for developers to fit their rec pricing mechanism into what fits their individual financing needs and structures. So I'll pause there to see if there's any feedback in any of those items. Not seeing anyone who's raised their hands. We can always circle if circle back to these at the end if someone um, has further observations. But I think we can move on to the next topic. It, just really quick, Anthony. So the argument for a price collar is essentially that it provides more budget certainty around those contract obligations costs, right? So Correct. because mm -hmm. you, you're cabining in, then um, even in times of particularly low wholesale prices, the degree to which the RPS budget is being spent on those individual contracts, which in theory would give 
more certainty around budget availability back to the market. So it would make our procurement process potentially more attractive. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, if people have thoughts on that, they can um, bring them up on slide 10 for other items. Um, I am uh, going to present this slide on the minimum equity standard. I've been doing a lot of the work for the agency on um, fleshing out the requirements for meeting the minimum equity standard in the competitive procurements um, for index recs. Um, we received a couple of comments on this, not too many, um, generally noting the uncertainty around being able to identify and hire equity eligible persons, particularly in rural areas and Southern Illinois. Um, we are very aware that some of the workforce training programs that would um, qualify a person as equity eligible are still um, being developed by the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. However, there are three other characteristics or, or bases upon which a person could qualify as an equity eligible person. So given the fact that um, there are these kind of three other bases, um, being a formerly incarcerated person, a uh, graduate of the foster care system or a primary re uh, permanent resident of an equity investment eligible community, which is a combination of environmental justice communities and our three areas as defined under the Cannabis Act. Um, so given that there are these three other paths to qualifying as an equity eligible person, um, one thing we wanted to put to the group um, is that is whether even with those additional categories, there is still concern that there's something unique about Southern Illinois or rural areas that would um, cause uh, trouble in, in finding sufficient equity eligible persons to hire. Um, we do have the option under the law for differentiating out or creating different ME, uh, minimum equity standards um, for different geographies. Um, we have not decided to do that yet, but the more information we have, um, the more you know, able we are to weigh whether that would be uh, necessary. Um, we also wanted to get some feedback on the reporting requirements. Um, we have essentially mirrored the reporting requirements that exist for the Illinois Shines program um, within the competitive index rec procurement. Um, but we do have some, you know, that that might not be the best way given how um, different those types of projects are. So we wanted to get an idea of whether um, this uncertainty or the viewpoint that this requirement might be um, uh, something can, companies are seeing as a barrier to participation is coming from those reporting requirements or whether it's the actual hiring standard itself. Um, and then also just wondering whether there are any other states or localities that um, have, uh, or even if there are companies that participate in the voluntary market have similar requirements and how they compare in terms of um, monitoring and verifying compliance. So if there are any thoughts on any of these um, or just on the MES requirements generally, um, they'd be very helpful. So MES requirements uh, were introduced through the passage of seizure 
and we'll put into the procurement's, uh, procurement requirements this morning uh, to find out from participants um, uh, how has these requirements uh, fared for you, uh, assuming that they are, that you have been able to find the appropriate information uh, to get uh, the MES requirements met. So any, anyone on the call in this uh, workshop has insights uh, based on your experience or observations, uh, we are quite interested to get your input on, on what have your what has been your uh, experience so far working through these. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, Please feel free to put comments or thoughts in the chat. Um, we can also come back to this slide as people think through it. Um, but uh, I know we have a lot to get through, so perhaps yeah. we could move on. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll uh, get to item number four. Um, so item number four is a kind of a cluster of issues closely re related to the budget issue, but not quite here. Uh, what is a little bit separate is that you're going to find collateral requirements in any contract. Um, we have received some comments uh, on not just collateral requirements, but the calibration of these requirements. Um, and uh, I think one commenter wanted uh, the collateral requirements to start at a lower uh, pace and perhaps move up from there. Um, and another uh, talked about having these uh, uh, requirements, collateral requirements that would really be somewhat of a, a proxy for liquidated damages to be tied to some mark to market calculation rather than uh, what is currently proposed in the contract, which is uh, pretty much a fixed uh, or tied to the collateral requirements that are fixed. Um, and wanted to find out from this group whether that's a financeability issue uh, at large um, and what are we trying to solve for uh, on this so i'd just like to see you know anyone have comments uh, please do raise your hand and i uh, will allow you to uh, comment on the collateral requirements and the structure of those uh, requirements Are there anything tied to collateral requirements uh, that uh, uh, poses as a financing issue? I know we talked about bias performance assurance um, early on when we talked about the budget, but besides that, uh, are there others, other issues with the collateral structure in the contracts uh, that we need to look at or address? If this is a big issue, we do need to know um, uh, where where to go from here. I'm not seeing any hands raised on collateral. All right, I think we'll move on to the next item, item number five then. Uh, this is something that was also touched on uh, a couple of times now on contract adjustments. Uh, I think commenters want to see more flexibility um, and these are flexibility, not so much to negotiate the contract up front. You always have the op opportunity to provide us comments, and we have a very formal comment uh, process up front for you to provide us input so that we know how, what to consider. Um, but here we are really after contract adjustments. After you have won, after you have signed a contract, um, if, is there room to amend the contract terms downstream? Um, and and we have uh, received a couple of very high level remarks on this, and we are really interested to know um, what others feel about that, given that uh, we have a competitive procurement, everyone kind of bid on the same terms and conditions. So what are the appropriate parameters we need to consider if we were to have uh, these types of contract adjustments? NYSERDA was brought up as uh, a place for us to look into. We will do that 
but uh, are there other state programs that others are familiar with that provide these contract flexibility? Um, and if uh, the folks on this call, if there are other um, uh, types of structures we should be looking at or things we should be considering, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the place for us to kind of uh, take input uh, from you on, on this particular issue. Like Sophia D, um, I'll prompt you to unmute. Hello, uh, this is Sophia again. Um, when it comes to the contract terms and requirements, um, something that, uh, at least for us, we widely view as a um, standard or a benchmark across the industry is uh, kind of what we are expected to provide as part of um, the MISO or PJM interconnection queue. Uh, I recall there were some uh, terms of uh, the IPA contract requirements that were um, even more rigid than um, the interconnection queue requirements, uh, the interconnection queue even after GIA um, execution, for example, has a pathway um, to terminate without um, creating uh, potential obstacles down the line for bidding in um, or entering the queue again. Um, there's just a variety of uh, uncertainty that goes into building a renewable energy project and every project that gets bid in i mean we would love for it to come online but sometimes uh, a variety of factors come together uh, and make that impossible so i uh, just wanted to uh, provide the comment that um, we would really encourage uh, the iepa to model the contracts after um, requirements that or uh, levels of flexibility that already exist in interconnection queues um, that would uh, that would help us um, I guess I suppose better know what to expect because we're already um, acquainted with those uh, levels of um, commitment mm, yeah uh, Sophia could you give a couple of examples on what would be triggers and I'm assuming, and you can confirm uh, and clarify for me, whether uh, you're after uh, some sort of an early termination right for developers with uh, minimal penalties if um, things do not go through due to the interconnection process. Yes, um, sorry, would you mind uh, elaborating on um, what sort of examples you would like? Oh, um, so there are a couple of requirements. I think I, I hear from you uh, at PGM or MISO um, as you enter into the queue. And if the project uh, fails to interconnect at some point, that um, there are examples of those why a project may not be connect interconnecting. Um, and there is an out, uh, or there might be some process or requirements uh, before you are allowed to to get out of that uh, of that queue, so I'm just trying to find out a little bit more information what that looks like. Um, sure, absolutely. Requirements. Uh, sure, I, I'm happy to speak to things at a broader level. Um, just to frame, uh, I guess our concerns. Something that uh, has been on our radar is the fact that overall we are seeing a tremendous amount of uh, uncertainty in the development space and um, it's uh, the type of uncertainty which um, individually can be um, uh, predicted or hedged for or mitigated in some sense, but um, all together, uh, the various types of uncertainties that are coming together create for, um, uh, they create uh, very unique situation. So from our perspective, what um, concerns, what is the most 
restrictive uh, when it comes to, say, an IPA contract term is the fact that um, if we bid in now and say, um, you know, it, it, during a very uncertain time for project development, and there is some sort of um, term in the contract which uh, creates uh, some sort of barrier or some sort of penalty to participate again in the future. Um, for us, I mean, we we hope uh, that things will get more certain in the future. Uh, so it, it's it's kind of like hedging or trying to decide um, if that if um, bidding in today is worth potentially foregoing future participation um, in the event of uh, something really unforeseen. So that's just a, a bit of context um, from the perspective that I, I suppose what um, is a, a bit unique to the IPA um, uh, contract versus the um, interconnection queue contracts. Uh, but when it comes to the interconnection queue, um, not only is there opportunity for negotiation of the GIA once uh, the project has been studied and executed, or, or um, uh, after it has been studied and uh, during the contract negotiation, um, there, there is a, a, a period for negotiation. And um, if the project does not go through with the negotiation, yes, it does um, lose some security at risk, um, but it is, um, it most projects that get there or every project that gets there should be ready to have that at risk. Uh, whereas if the contract is executed, um, there is, far more at risk. Um, so that's why the execution of the contract is so vital um, to a properly negotiate and consider. But even then, if project does not come online, um, the project has uh, requirements to um, forfeit the security at risk and potentially um, uh, go through uh, harm review and see if there are um, any things that the project needs to make whole. But um, uh, in no point is there kind of a consequence for future participation in the queue. So that's a, a little bit of the background of um, how uh, we are used to handling things through the interconnection queue. Yeah. And when it comes to the IPA contract, uh, which is, I think, one level downstream from that. Um, are you looking for some provision, especially if it's unforeseen, to be in force majeure uh, section of the contract, or uh, are you looking for something else? So uh, while uh, while the force majeure is something that we very much considered, we do see force majeure as um, very um, stringent and strict uh, projects are required to be within force majeure for a met for oh they're supposed to be um, within um, difficult circumstances uh, for a prolonged period of time before uh, force majeure is um, able to kick in the litigation is quite um, um, onerous and the definitions for force majeure are um, quite strict. Uh, for example, there could be the argument that um, you should have foreseen the fact that you could have permitting issues, but it's like we, th there, there is, there is always the risk of permitting issues, you know. Um, so we feel that um, force majeure um, is uh, perhaps to, um, the definition is uh, too narrow um, and the terms too rigid to provide kind of the flexibility that we would be looking for in a uh, voluntary contract. I see. And and where does it surface? Um, are, you, are you thinking that there will be special provisions that talks about permitting and flexibility surrounding that outside of force majeure or could the force majeure provisions be uh, adjusted to accommodate this issue? In terms of uh, specific um, 
uh, thoughts or recommendations, uh, that's something that um, I would have to take back to my contracting team. But overall, um, a practice that um, really uh, helps us get on the same page as the um, uh, as our buyer uh, and make sure that there's just overall good communication and best faith effort um, to provide what we would really like to provide um, is the opportunity to uh, renegotiate or negotiate should something come up. Um, uh, having specific terms for, um, you know, in the event of this permit or in the event of these interconnection rights or in the event of this and this, uh, there, sh you know, shall be opportunity to renegotiate. That would be very helpful for us in terms of um, contract flexibility. Um, but if, if you're looking for uh, specific things to um, a, a specific permitting or interconnection rights, um, milestones, I would have to go back to my team mm. with that. Thank yeah. you so much for your okay. questions. I really appreciate this dialogue and for yeah. you guys providing the the forum for this. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. I think your input is quite quite useful to us. And I think for the rest on the call as well, to start thinking about um, how, if, if these are real issues, how we can uh, make the contract more uh, amenable and uh, especially uh, for the financing parties and how to think about uh, these issues um, that were raised. Um, and in, in particular, I think I'll just flag one thing downstream, we'll have a comment process and we will be looking for, uh, to see what specific evidence or milestones we should really be looking at for these types of permitting requirements and the appropriate parameters for us to put some boundaries uh, around what types of situations, uh, what triggers we should be considering for purposes of uh, these types of um, changes or amendments to the contract. Um, I, I am not sure if there are other comments. If you have other comments on this particular point, please raise them now. Please raise your hands now. Not seeing uh, any at this time. Hannah, can you confirm this? this? Yep, no, no, no one knew. Okay, thank you. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, um, item six, uh, in, out of interest of time, I think item six and seven, you know, I kind of will we'll talk about that briefly. This deals with uh, the performance metric. We have uh, performance requirements under the contract, mainly for you to deliver racks, deliver racks of a particular quantity. Um, and if you fail to meet them, we do have flexibility around how much you can fall short across the term of the agreement, um, so as to accommodate and recognize the fact that your resource is intermittent. So we receive quite a number of comments uh, tied to, you know, can we have excess racks used to uh, fill the shortfall, replacement racks from other facilities, things like that. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, mainly before I open up the floor, just to lay out a couple of key principles, not to presuppose what the solution is, but just really uh, to at least give you some idea what uh, we have looked at, what we have been thinking about to help uh, identify the problem statement a little better so that you and I, uh, we can help each other solve this together. So first, uh, I think as a, as a principle, under a competitive procurement structure, we are looking for, you know, the quantity of racks from suppliers as they bid in, um, and these bid quantities you name have wider implications in the procurement process. If you are selected based on price, uh, that means that others may not be selected um, if we have met the procurement quantity. So we do want to ensure that the size of your bids are not speculative. Um, and that you have at least some way to hit those quantities. Otherwise, uh, someone else may not have uh, the opportunity to receive an award simply because you name a quantity that is not realistic uh, and you are chronically underperforming and really have no way to 
hit those quantities. Um, so I think that that's the first item. We are looking for serious bids. Um, we recognize that your resource is intermittent. We will build flexibility to help you optimize and address shortfall if needed. Um, and we, we are just wanting to make sure that there is a way for you to, to hit those quantities, um, at least you know, at some point in the contract term. We also recognize um, as a second principle that the index rack mechanism that we have allows for payment both ways. Uh, sometimes payment will flow from buyer to seller and sometimes from seller to buyer. And we want to avoid any optionality in the mechanism uh, as we implement any uh, flexibility into the contracts uh, so that it doesn't become a conduit for gaming um, or optionality on how you use a mechanism. And part of that is that whatever mechanism we put in place, um, it doesn't become something that is influenced by whether the contract is in the money or out of the money. Um, and I think with uh, those principles, um, I hope you know we're giving some insight into how we're struggling with, with uh, implementing some of the flexibilities uh, and want to hear from you, the stakeholders, what your pain points are. Uh, if this is a big problem as we currently have calibrated requirements um, or uh, if there's something we can uh, do better to help solve the issue. So um, maybe I'll key up the first item on access racks uh, that are from the project. Could they be used to um, cover any shortfall from a prior year? Uh, I think there's some things we can do surrounding that, but then the question becomes respecting and honoring the index rack mechanism uh, how do we uh, pay for those RECs? Or could they be just RECs received to fill a shortfall without a price tied to them? Um, otherwise, we need to base those on some vintage. Um, and the index REC structure provides you know, very, very specific um, uh, ideas on on how the REC mechanism payment settlement uh, structure should work. And um, I think the more general questions is, is really, you know, in these types of contract for differences, um, how do other states or other contracts deal with this uh, if you do allow for replacement RECs or contract RECs as a mechanism to fill any shortfall? I'll, I'll just pause for a second to see whether there are any uh, any party wants to raise comments or offer and propose some uh, discussion or dialogue surrounding this. Maybe I'll turn to the next item. I'll discuss that a little bit, and then we can kind of take comments together on these two slides. Yeah. So the other, the other item that we, we did receive a couple of uh, comments on is really uh, tied to um, the annual quantity and how do we consider shortfall. Um, again, right now, we do ask that you have some ability to hit those targets, those procurement targets as binding commitments, uh, but we do af afford some flexibility. Um, and the flexibility we allow is that you can kind of miss um, your quantity um, and, and incur some sort of a shortfall uh, for up to five years, right? You don't need to be hitting those quantity each and every year. Um, and you may not uh, be, penalized or uh, considered to have a shortfall um, for the first um, four years, really. The first year is really a uh, not counted against you. Um, the first full year, and you could have a stop year up front plus three, three years after. Um, so it becomes a problem only if you fail to meet it for um, three full years after the first year and the first stop year um, and the aggregate uh, 
of the shortfall quantity exceeds the annual quantity. So that's sort of how we have calibrated things. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, this is not unduly burdensome or miscalibrated uh, for um, folks. And, and that's sort of uh, what this particular item is about. So maybe I'll, I will just stop uh, at this uh, slide 20 and see if there are any questions that, or comments from interested stakeholders here. Yeah. See the comment from Michelle. You should be able to unmute. Hi, this is Michelle. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, hey everyone. I, I wanted to pose a question. Why why not just think of this in a unit contingent form instead of having an 80% or sorry, uh, you know, specific annual quantity mm. that is fixed. Um, why not just make it an obligation that as we generate, those recs are yours, right? Um, so I see your key principle here, avoid the possibility of gaming, which seller chooses whether to deliver the recs or not based on which direction payment flows. But if the quantity that we owe the IPA under the contract is unit contingent in the sense that as we generate, those recs are yours, yep. right? There would be no gaming, right? And so it kind of, goes back to your item six as well about what to do with excess recs. I mean, it, it solves your excess recs issue. Yeah. Um, and then I understand that you want to make sure that you have, you know, you can bank on a certain number of recs every year. Um, it, there are other contracts. The contracts that we prefer are unit contingent. So as we generate, we deliver you recs and we you know, settle on the energy portion. And then there is a, uh, they're liquidated damages if we fail to perform. Mm. So that's when, how you make sure that you meet your minimum. Yeah, and when you say they're liquidated damages, when you fail to perform, what does non-performance look like in, in that context? So there are different ways to measure non-performance. And the most common is uh, an availability-based um, mechanism where basically uh, we make sure that, it, so, the two main ways are availability-based or production-based. And the preference, I think, is, is generally availability-based, where you make sure that your product is up and running, you know, 90% of the time. Um, and so, you know, if we don't meet the 90%, then we pay uh, LDs. And then your second option, second most popular option is production-based, where that's, you know, us saying that, hey, you know, based on our observations of weather patterns, we're going to make sure that we meet this number of megawatt hours every year. So that, you know, either way gives you comfort around the, the minimum number of recs you'll get every year. Mm, yeah. And it's our preference over the specified annual quantity, which leaves us with um, uncontracted revenue streams because the this fixed annual quantity over the life of the contract, um, we're going to set as below what we actually generate. Right to make sure that we need it. Yeah, I I I, I hear you, and, and I think there are at least two side uh, follow up questions. It kind of kick the tires a little bit on this one. So in the scenario where you, uh, how do we ensure that you know no system is chronically under delivering that in such a way where you you bid in a very high quantity, but realistically there is no way you're going to meet those quantities anyways. It is unit contingent, um, but the wider procurement implication is that we would have already thrown out some of the bits in the procurement because uh, this this bit quantity that was selected uh, was unrealistic um, and it has caused uh, another project not to be selected. So that's one. And the second is for budgetary purposes, we are kind of thinking through uh, uh, number of recs that would be incurred in a year. Um, and if the number of recs ex exceed that, that means you bid uh, a, a really low number, but your recs are really, really high in terms of what they come in. Are you expecting payment for those in exceedance of um, the quantity? And um, how, how would we be able to budget for that access, um, if that overperformance, you know, on the flip side, is uh, is also chronic in that sense. Mm 
So I think it, it poses a little bit of a complexity on both sides and we're kind of open and, and wanting to hear how we could solve for this. Yeah, so I mean, if you're assuming that you receive the P50 uh, of expected of a project expected generation year over year, you're over multiple projects, it's going to average pretty close to that. So maybe you know a single project may over generate in one year, uh, and then next year it'll under generate. But hopefully you have projects across Illinois um, where you know that evens out. So I don't think that there. I don't think that there would be that much deviation if you're just assuming the P50. So what is actually generated from each project? Sure, there should be, you know, there, there, there will be certain low wind years um, and certain high wind years. Um, but from a solar perspective and seeing that most projects, at least I don't think you've selected any wind projects in the past procurement. It seems like most projects moving forward will be solar. You know, solar is much more predictable than wind. So the deviation just should be minimal. Um, the generation bands, or the bands, the probability bands around solar generation are a lot tighter um, than for wind, which is which is more unpredictable. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure that I completely understood your first question. Could you uh, repeat it? Yeah. So the, the first question uh, it's less about individual projects, but the fact that. Uh, we have a competitive procurement. If we receive um, bids and the size of the bids uh, is uh, large or speculatively large, and uh, that may mean that we have to throw out other projects uh, so that they are not selected. Mm -hmm. um, even if we enter into these contingent, unit contingent um, structures, uh, uh, should we be uh, how do we address whether, you know, the the issue that uh, some bits, the size of the bits, uh, may be speculative, and the wider implication that you know some bits may not have been selected, because it has um, yeah. procurement implications. I'm just trying to un understand a little bit of this. You could, solution to that. Yeah, I think I think that could probably be addressed pretty easily. You can just require a third party report. Um, that verifies your production estimates, and that you know, that can be required with your with your bid, and it can just be like a, a checkbox of, oh look, I you know I want to make sure that this project, this bidder got a you know another engineering company to verify their production estimates, and they're not being um, overly aggressive with their production estimates. But you know, if you want to do a production based guarantee, then a bidder being aggressive with their production estimates to overly aggressive could hurt them, right? Um, yeah, that, that being said, I mean, I, I do think that switching from these fixed quantities to a unit contingent, you know, as generated contract um, would make this a, a much more attractive contract for renewable energy developers. Okay, the, uh, I have a follow-up question then. Mm -hmm. Right now, we look for bids based on the bid quantity, the rack quantities on an mm -hmm. annual basis, but we do not have restrictions on size besides meeting the definition for what a utility scale project means, um, for example. But we allow for size changes, um, quite flexibility. We don't even mention that in the contract itself um, because we, we afford that flexibility. With a unit contingent basis, I guess we should bring in the size requirements then, I think. Otherwise, we don't know what we are uh, uh, looking at in terms of measuring this um, and affording uh, the flexibility that you are looking for through a unit contingent. Does it make sense? And I'm just not sure what the, the right calibration would be in terms of deviation. Um, because right now, you know, if you bid a smaller project, you could build a larger system to get to those numbers and, and that flexibility is yours. We don't really care how big or small your projects are. We just care that you meet those quantity requirements. Is that less attractive than the unit contingent basis? Yeah, it is. It is? Okay. Yeah, because if we, you know, you know, promise a quantity to you and then overbuild the project, 
we're still having to finance a project. Well, for, I guess, a couple of things. To answer your, your first question, though, there's always the buyer's share concept, right? Yep. Um, so uh, rather than being a fixed quantity, right, we can just bid the P50, um, which it would, or a P50 and 100% of the buyer, of the project's output. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, we could, we could just do like 50% of the P50 or something. Um, but to your other question, you know, if we contract a small amount with you mm. and, you know, build the project higher and contract it with someone else, you know, then sure, we, we are contracting all the revenue, not all the revenue, because we still have to, you know, we're still bidding a, a specific quantity to you. So we need to you know, be conservative there with the quantity that we are sort of allocating to you, if that makes sense, because we want to make sure that we um, hit that fixed quantity every year. Um, and obviously you have that termination trigger. Is this, yeah, yeah. deliver at least 80% of the annual quantity over three years. So we want to make sure that we absolutely hit that. So there is going to be uncontracted revenue at that project um, because we have this fixed quantity obligation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm uh, trying to understand if this is actually uh, a better solution to having a fixed quantity, um, but allowing a lot of flexibility for shortfall, which is kind of what we currently have. But I am kind of open to ideas on this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think when we come to the actual contract comment process, this, this is sort of the type of um, comments that we would like to see and consider uh, and to kind of weigh the merits and how to think about the, uh, the penalties as well as the, um, what we are trying to encourage in the development and, and how big an issue this is. So I do appreciate your comments here and certainly look forward to your written comments on how we can actually implement this more tangibly into the contracts uh, when, when the draft contracts are released in a few weeks from now. Thank you. Wanted to check uh, because you know uh, we receive a, a sometimes comments from a diverse group of participants. Um, we sometimes run into the inadvertent issue of accommodating some comments, but um, uh, some of the developers may express a, an opposite direction of where we should be traveling. Maybe I'll pause here and see whether others have um, views that either second what uh, Michelle was uh, alluding to or have um, other considerations for us uh, to think about. Anyone else on this contract delivery um, and shortfall uh, issue for us to consider? Hey, I'm not seeing any uh, hands raised on this issue. Um, I think uh, we look forward to your comments in the in written form when the draft contracts are out, uh, so that we can consider this more more um, fully. Um, in the meantime, let's move on to the next item, item eight. Uh, Katie, do you want to talk about this slide? Sure, thanks, Ben. So we're switching topics to benchmark. Um, and so comments were received regarding the process to prepare benchmarks. Um, and before going into the comments, I'm gonna provide just a little background on the process for everyone here at the workshop. Uh, so the benchmarks are developed by the procurement administrator in consultation with commission staff, the IPA and the procurement monitor. Um, it's done ahead of the procurement event. Uh, the benchmarks are filed with the commission for review and approval on a confidential basis, and both the resulting benchmarks and the methodology are kept confidential. Um, and then during the evaluation on the bid date, bids that don't meet the benchmark um, are eliminated from consideration. So that's sort of the current um, process. And we received a lot of uh, good feedback um, a lot of it was in regards to providing transparency to bidders 
and stakeholders on the method used to calculate the benchmark. Um, some of the feedback we received uh, is listed here. Uh, so to the extent allowable, providing information on benchmark formulation uh, would be appreciated. Uh, we heard um, that opportunities for entities to offer third-party analysis or market reports uh, could help inform the IPA's decision process and result in a more successful event. Um, also, benchmarks must reflect all external factors and state law factors, um, and developers should be allowed to comment on the, the concepts that are considered in development. Um, so we appreciate your comments and uh, we provide some discussion items here, um, but we'd like to give everyone an opportunity to, you know, comment on these comments or expand on the comments um, on this topic of benchmark formulation transparency or other uh, feedback on, on benchmarking. Are there any changes to this process that would be beneficial uh, to the procurement process that you'd like to discuss? Well, I think, um, you know, again, we appreciate your comments and input and we'll be considering um, these suggestions. And we certainly heard loud and clear in spring about the different risks and uncertainty that everyone's facing. Um, and so again, thanks for that. If we don't have any comments, I think we can move to topic nine and I'll continue. So topic nine, we received comments from developers that specialize in developing solar on brownfield sites. Um, and so there's a carve out target for RECs from projects that qualify under this category. Uh, so recognizing that brownfield is a niche in the market and uh, do not necessarily participate in wholesale energy markets in the same way as utility scale solar or wind do, you know, to start the conversation, the written feedback process posed questions about the appropriateness of the index rec mechanism for these projects, um, or generally feedback on how to better support these projects. Um, and so we'd like to hear more, you know, obviously about how to better support development of Brownfield. Um, so what we heard was that there should be incentives for additional re remote offtake structures, uh, such as community solar. Uh, providing a greater degree of confidence in whether incentives are available for one or more years down the road, increasing procurement targets, um, allowing for greenfield development around the brownfield fight site to be eligible. Um, so for instance, expanding the definition under the act to allow the entire property of a power plant and not just qualifying features on that property um, to be qualified as brownfield sites. Um, and then we heard concerns that small scale brownfield projects may not be competitive in this category. Uh, and then I also wanted to note that commenters explain the projects face unique risks uh, and incur additional costs during the process. And so I'd like to you know, open the floor uh, to let anyone expand on these comments or provide additional feedback. I'm not seeing any hand raised. Um, 
So thanks again, everyone, for the comments received. Um, we'll be taking them very seriously. Oh, I think we got a hand raised here. Okay. Let's see. Um, you should be able to unmute. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay? Yes. Yep. Um, hi. Thank you. Um, for putting this session and, and listening to our concerns. So uh, we are one of the developers that sent these comments about the brownfields. And I wanted to ask if the IPA would consider making a special carve out for projects under five megawatts, which is something that happens a lot when we are developing in brownfields and that other states have. And it seems to work, at least in our experience. Yeah. Well, one clarifying question, uh, and I might turn this to the agency. But the 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 brownfield actually has a separate carve out target already in our procurements, um, and brownfield site photovoltaic projects are evaluated separate from the utility scale projects. Um, I, I guess is your question uh, tied to whether you want to have an administratively set price rather than a competitive bid um, for your brownfield projects? Is that your question? Yeah, I think either that or because many times brownfields won't be, I don't know, maybe there will be like smaller size brownfields that won't be competitive enough especially if at some point green fields can be used around brown fields that might be even larger than the brown field areas themselves. And also the, just wanna emphasize the remote offtake structure, which is something that is very important and will help a lot. So this is something that, this is Brian from the IPA, it's something I think we can take into consideration in the development of our next long-term plan proceeding. Um, what might be helpful is to get an understanding of the qualitative differences between smaller brownfield projects as opposed to larger brownfield projects. And ultimately, there are certain public policy objectives that we're seeking to accomplish through procurement of uh, uh, brownfield site photovoltaic projects or procurement of rec delivery contracts from brownfield site photovoltaic projects that are a little bit different than what we're doing in the utility scale realm so if there's like a a way in which it's possible to articulate if you don't separately support small projects then projects like this which offer this other suite of benefits will be squeezed out by larger projects that um can leverage economies of scale i think that's what what's what's probably most helpful to us here i'm not sure if there's a way to articulate that easily though i think my I think I my question then would be actually if the rec price will be different for the brownfields than for the utility scale projects. Well, structurally, that's already the case because brownfield okay. site projects um, ultimately are evaluated separately from the okay. utility scale projects. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. But I thought maybe the concern was larger brownfield site projects will ultimately clip smaller brownfield site projects, but there's qualitative differences between the two project types. Yeah, I would say five megawatts or less. I think I would like to add one thing, um, a note that not only are they evaluated separately, you know, these are just comments for the future. This allow for greenfield development right now. Um, you know, or in past um, events, to qualify, the project has to be cited entirely on a brownfield uh, feature or qualifying site. And anything that's co-located with that brownfield would be bid separately as a utility scale project with a separate meter. And just a clarifying point. Yeah. I think my, my concern is that now I understood better is the different rec prices for brownfields and for 
um, other projects. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I hear. I hear you. I think. I think that might be for the rest uh, on this call in the session. Uh, maybe we'll just uh, talk about this and uh, and flag two things. One is that there is a definition, a very strict definition for what is considered um, a brownfield project uh, by us. Um, that definition is straight from the law. Uh, the term they use is the brownfield site photovoltaic projects. We have that in our RFP rules and in the contract. So. Whatever projects you're bidding in as a brownfield projects must comply or conform to that definition, meet that definition um, that is there. So that's one. Two, I think um, to be very clear for everybody's uh, sake, the uh, brownfield site photovoltaic projects are not competing with utility scale projects. They are evaluated separately and they have their own carve out and bucket uh, for which they're competing against each other. So I think that hopefully that's clear. Um, are there other comments on Brownfield before we move on to uh, our last item? Not seeing an in interest of time. Why don't we move to, to item number 10? So this is kind of a free for all. Um, uh, in case you want to uh, raise comments on things that we already talked about or if you have other items that have not yet been covered. I think this is kind of the last slide we have on items. Uh, and we just want to pause here uh, to kind of um, let uh, stakeholders uh, provide us your comments. Um, you can really you know, raise anything you want uh, in this last uh, item in this section here. Don't let some of the uh, suggested discussion items here or the uh, items of discussion um, limit you. So maybe I'll, I'll say less than more, probably that's the, the better tech here. But we want to hear from you, what are the pain points you're facing or things that you have you, uh, done well? Uh, we want to know that as well so that we don't take that inadvertently out uh, as we continue to improve on our, our process and requirements. So um, if you have anything you'd like to let us know, whether it's good or bad, uh, and things we can improve on, we kind of I would like to uh, provide you this opportunity here in the last 10 minutes um, and be respectful of the time that we have allocated for everybody else here uh, uh, for, for comments. Anyone have anything else um, that is not already covered uh, or comments not been heard that you, you would like to raise on this call? Uh, please do raise your hands now. Not seeing any, but I would wanna ask one question, which is the last item here. Uh, on this slide, um, this session, this workshop has been pretty helpful for us to think about uh, the procurement structure and approach more holistically. Um, we are holding uh, a procurement in the summer of 23 in a couple of months from now. And want to see, is this type of dialogue useful for stakeholders? Should we have another workshop that is focused on just the upcoming summer 2023 procurement. Um, you know, we kind of want to know if this, you think this would be helpful. Uh, if not, then we might uh, skip, you know, having another workshop to discuss more specifically the summer 23 procurement. Um, but if you think it's helpful, we kind of uh, would want to have that feedback. Not seeing any hands raised uh, at this time. Hannah, can you confirm? Yep, uh, not seeing any hands. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll ask Anthony or Brian, any, or Sarah, anything else to add? Um, I'm, I'm not seeing any other 
comments uh, or stakeholders raising their hands at this point? The one thing I would uh, just sort of <clears throat> add is if, if parties have any ideas on what the most effective way is for us to engage the General Assembly to highlight some of the structural concerns that we've discussed um, during this presentation and to reach out to us. And there's nothing ex parte about talking about potential bill ideas. Um, and I think we struggle sometimes with being this independent state agency that's um, intended to be structurally insulated from politics, but also has this a lot of insights into things that may need to happen through legislation in order to fix certain problems that we see so it becomes difficult because we're, these sorts of things aren't things where it's appropriate for us to really run a bill on it, but um, it is probably important for us to highlight certain concerns. So if you have ideas along those lines, uh, just let us know. I think, I think we're, we're always trying to do that better. So uh, we're, we're open to feedback there. Thanks, Brian. Um, Hannah, can you turn over to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so we have our contact information here. Sorry. Again, this presentation as well as the audio recording will be posted to the agency's website after uh, this workshop. Uh, if you have further comments or questions, feel free to uh, send us an email. Um, and certainly if there are any requirements that you think are ambiguous at this time that needs to be clarified, do send us. Uh, an email and we will address that um, on point. Um, with that, on behalf of the oh, Illinois... Oh, sorry, Ben. Uh, it looks like we might have one question. Oh, okay. Um, Michelle K, um, you should be able to unmute. Michelle? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to your last point, um, I feel that this is, I think, like the third stakeholder workshop or third round of stakeholder comments that we've been through. and really the, a lot of the same points get raised each time. And I absolutely understand that IPA is doing as much as they can to address these comments, but we don't really get that much clarity about what you've tried, what you've thought about and what you've rejected. If there's any way for IPA to uh, put in writing the ideas that have been considered and why they've been rejected, I think that would be really helpful. And that would also make these stakeholder workshops more valuable in the future so that we know what points not to <laughs> re-raise. Like it, it, it sometimes feels like we're beating a dead bush on some of these recommendations. And even looking at the comments that have been posted in this last round, they're nearly identical to the ones that were posted. And uh, I don't remember when the last one was in November or whatever it was, right? Um, so I, I would say that would just help everyone uh, and probably make it a better use of time to get more productive uh, recommendations going forward. That's all very fair. Thanks for the feedback, Michelle. I know in other contexts, <clears throat> for example, um, we release rationale documents accompanying different determinations that we make. And, mm -hmm. and we try to do that for that very reason, because it's important that parties see what our thought process was why we chose one thing versus another. Sometimes it's frankly just a matter of time and resources. We're trying to move processes forward as far as what we publish. Um, I think the best thing, if just for what it's worth, if you're looking into, if you're trying to infer any of that, if you look at the evolution of our questions over time, you'll see a little bit about our thought process. So some of the sub parts to questions that we asked this time were um, might provide some insight into where we're struggling with certain concepts and why we haven't adopted them or why we don't feel like we can. And why we're trying to get guidance back on what the right mechanism would be for us to do so. That's probably not satisfying, but um, in, going, in going through and helping put together some of the questions we asked this time around, that, that's kind of how I thought about it is if someone's reading this question, they'll know maybe why it is that we have not adopted this alternative or why we feel like we can't. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that. I understand so much of this is confidential and you have to walk a very thin line, but some of the questions were like, what are the challenges that you are facing in the industry this time around? And it's really just not different from the last time. And, and you're right, like the questions were a little bit more focused this time. And I could see the IPA thought process through it, but obviously it is not explicit and there is some inference that we have to make. Um, but, but I appreciate that answer. I would add to that also that I mean, ultimately some of the challenges that we're facing are ones that are going to require statutory changes. So 
there are not items for which the IPA can make changes to our procurement process right now. But getting the feedback, and I think this is, goes to what Brian was asking earlier, the feedback we've gotten, I think, helps sharpen the point in terms of what are the structural challenges that, 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 that face the, the index rec model under the current statutory framework. And so that, that, that certainly can help as those conversations go forward with the General Assembly to sort of focus in on you know, where, cha where changes should be considered. Got it, many things. Okay, and with that, uh, thanks Michelle for those uh, very valuable input uh, at the end. Um, and we'll definitely take that comment to heart. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for today's uh, participation and uh, we look forward to your continued interest in our procurements. You may now disconnect.